everyone, thanks for joining us here on Go Local Live in the Navigate Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Molly O'Brien. It is Thursday, March 29th, and because it is officially spring and it's finally starting to feel like spring, we have some organizing and efficiency tips for you to get you ready for spring. I'm joined by Kristen McRae of Organizing NRI. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us Hey, today. Molly. Good to be here. So, Kristen, spring's a good time, <laughs> yes. like you said, to get energized and bring in some good energy for your home, right? Yeah, it's a great time to do it. If you're overwhelmed, you want to start with these small projects, release that overwhelm, and then you can move on to the bigger projects, like organizing your garage, like we talked about last week. If it was too overwhelming, or the week before too overwhelming, we're going to break it down with small projects for you today. So I love this idea. We have 12 small projects that you can complete in 30 minutes or less. So uh, you could, you can, <laughs> and you should be able to. Right. And if you can't, well, that's why we're giving you a small project to tackle. So you can like set your timer, right? Exactly. So another thing you said that um, these are good projects to do if you get overwhelmed, you still should plan it out, like set a date. Plan, your, plan, plan it out on your calendar, look ahead, see what you have going on this month, and, set, and plug in all these little projects. Maybe one week you want to tackle one of them, the next week another one, the next week another one, and go from there. So that way by the end of April, you'll have tackled these 12 spots, and then you can move on again to those other projects. But at least you can plan out your whole month right now. You can plan it all out, so yes. let's do it. All right, all right so the let's first go. one to tackle. So we have 12 projects to tackle this spring, and again, hopefully you can complete them in 30 minutes or less. <laughs> set that timer, and you head and go. right in. Uh -huh. and then you'll feel great. Okay, right. number one, the nightstand. This is a really quick project. Again, the last thing you want to see before you go to bed is the dust on the nightstand, and the first thing when you wake up in the morning, you don't want to see that clutter either. So if there's anything, take a look at your nightstand. If there's anything on there collecting dust right now, if it's a magazine, I highly doubt you're going to curl up with that dusty magazine in bed this weekend to read. So I want you to take inventory of what's on there, Throw out anything that's dusty, and if it's dusty, reevaluate if you need to put it somewhere else in the house. You want to keep exactly what you need before you go to bed and when you wake up in the morning on that nightstand. The nightstand shouldn't be a drop spot for things that you don't know what to do with. Maybe a chapstick, maybe um, a charging cord, maybe a nightlight, little things like that. But aside from that and a book, what else do you need on your nightstand? So Not much. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Okay. <laughs> Number two, the junk drawer. I love a good junk drawer. Uh, this, this will not take you long. It shouldn't take you long. But how many of you want an extra drawer in your kitchen? Some of you might have two junk drawers in the kitchen. Twelve. All yeah. of them. Yeah. All right. Some people might have all of them. They okay. Just, they end up being a catch-all. So if you want that extra drawer in the kitchen or that extra space, Take everything out of that junk drawer, reevaluate what's in there. Sometimes you might have batteries stored all over the house and in the junk drawer. Get them out of the junk drawer. Keep your batteries in one spot in the house so when the lights do go out next time, when you have a storm, which is probably going to be you know, you know, <laughs> not too. Uh, so when, when you need to get those batteries, you'll know where they are. They're not going to be all over the junk drawer. So create a home for like things so that way they don't take up space in that junk drawer. So you can have that junk drawer, but it can be organized for things that you need to grab on a daily basis. Okay. Um, and, and you said too, oh, and we've talked about this several times before, but measuring is so crucial. So when you're doing so a junk important. drawer, measure it. Yes, uh, when the junk drawer is empty, evaluate what you're left with, what's categorized out, take a picture of it, which I've been telling a lot of people to do now, take a picture of it and then measure your drawer height with length. Take your picture and your measurements to the store so that way when you get to the store you have your measurements and you also have what was in the drawer that you should organize so you can purchase the exact piece to match. Okay. Number three, this is a fun one, socks. Quick, easy project. Easy. When's the last time you took everything out of your sock drawer? Everything out. So again, empty the drawer, follow that same process, but think about the basket on the kitchen table of mismatched socks that you have, or the basket on the dining room floor of the mismatched socks. Maybe tackle that this weekend. Figure out, just tackle it once and for all. Empty out all the socks, match them up, get the kids involved. It's a great project for them to that's get great, involved yeah, with. Yeah, that's good. And figure out whose socks are whose, and then going forward, when you're doing laundry, Make an effort to actually get these socks together so they can go in a drawer so your kids aren't running around you know, in the morning for school trying to find a match their sock. So tackle a sock drawer this weekend. That's a quick, easy project. Don't you find it frustrating when you actually get rid of your sock? Like you're like, okay, I can't find the matching sock to this, so then you get rid of it, and then like the next week you, you find, find it. Matching, so you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a great little project. Get the kids involved in that one. <laughs> okay, number four, business cards. I love this idea oh. that you have on getting rid of the business cards. So I want you to think about first. So many people are spending tons of money on business cards. 
And let me tell you, you're wasting money. Why? Because I see this happen all the time. Business cards on the floor in offices, business cards and desks on the, on the top of your desk. People aren't even looking at business cards. So if you're spending a ton of money on business cards, use that money elsewhere because it's a waste of money. I'll tell you flat out. But there's a few things you can do. You can throw, put, go on LinkedIn, connect with everybody on LinkedIn, and then throw the card away. The other option is maybe to get them in a database. Another option, go old school. A good old fashioned Rolodex. There's nothing wrong with a good old fashioned Rolodex. And it works really well for some people, but they people have gotten rid of it because everyone's like, oh, you gotta go digital, but then the system doesn't work. So whatever system works for you, use that system, but you have to get a system. You have to get a system. You have to get a system. It's the death of everybody, business cards. All right, it's interesting how many you can learn to stack up, and then when you're looking for your contact, do you go to your business card right. or do you, do you go to your email contacts? Exactly. Or do you Google them online? Or do you go to LinkedIn? Or do you go to Facebook? Right. So so depending on what you do, find that system that works for you. Like I always end up just looking them up in my email. Right. So Yeah. That so works why for do you me. need the business cards? Think about even the piles that you have, how long does it take you to find one that you exactly. need? Really? Yeah. So exactly. think about that. Exactly. Okay. So I love the idea of connecting with people on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, love it. And maybe it's time to Maybe one of these projects can be to thin out your LinkedIn or to bump up your LinkedIn. Start exactly. organizing yeah. your LinkedIn, right? <laughs> it's another project. Okay. Work bag. Your work bag is another one. It's a quick one, too. What's in there now? Take everything out. When's the last time you took everything out of your bag? I always like, that's my always go-to. Yeah. When's the last time you emptied this? Because you never know how long does it take you to find things in there, how many pieces of paper you're touching before you need to t find the paper that you really need. Again, efficiency. Something as simple, simple as your bag, you might say, oh, it doesn't matter. But really think about how much time is wasted looking for things. So that's something to think about going forward with this. And that way, if you could put your hand on something you need immediately and go about your day, throughout your entire day, think about the time you could save. So again, just maybe using pouches in the bag to contain certain writing instruments or folders to contain certain pieces of paper that you might go to all the time or folders or binders. Get it all contained so when you grab, put your hand in there, you can grab what you need and go about your day. So Kristen gave me that pencil pouch to put oh, that's my right. belongings Are you using in. It? Oh yeah, from the dollar store, <laughs> the, do awesome. the dollar store thing. I love it. So thank you for that gift. I, I now put my wallet, my keys, and my cell phone in there, and maybe like oh, one or yeah. two like chapstick, whatever, like my essentials yeah. in my work bag. Done. I'm organized. All right, very good. In my I'm work bag, it all. can work for you too. I love it. Love it. it was a dollar. It was a dollar. Go figure. It was a dollar. <laughs> okay, so that can, so get your work bag in order. There's probably stuff in there that people don't even know, like receipts or things like that. Things that you can just get rid of. Exactly. All that kind of yep. good stuff. Okay, number six, another fun one, electronic cords. How many people oh, have electronic cords God. in their basement, in their junk drawer, and that, that don't go to anything or they don't know what it goes to? Right, so another great project, pull that bin out. And people are like, oh, I don't even want to touch those cords because... Yeah. I might need it. Exactly. And I did this with a client I in the summer. We went through the, this whole box and she's like, I know I could do this by myself, but I really need you here to help me because it'll make it go quicker and I know we'll get it done. So it's, it was a matter of every cord came out. She was like going to look for cameras to see if the cords yeah. match. And the, I mean, we literally did it in 15 minutes. Wow. And we threw out a ton of cords because really, if they don't go to anything, what do you need them for? You your, never, and you haven't gone to look for these cords. They're in a tangled mess. You haven't yeah. used them in years. So half of that stuff you don't need, just get rid of and you'll feel a lot lighter. Your printer cord from 1999. Right. You probably don't have that printer cord. I probably won't need <laughs> Especially it. Especially if you're using a printer with a cord already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My printer's Bluetooth. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. <laughs> your VCR cord. Right. I don't have a VCR anymore. Okay. <laughs> so that's a good one to do. Right. Quick and easy, but a daunting one. So just tackle it. It is. We have a we have a really heavy. Do you? Box. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on a calendar for this weekend. Uh, no. Some, someone else I know that I live with can do that. He's pretty organized about the cord box. All right, good. All right, first aid. This is a really good one, especially for spring. People's allergies are coming yes. out. They're going to be outside more. Kids get cuts, all that kind of yeah, fun stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's a great time of year to do this because, again, like just like you said, so go around the house, round up all your meds. How many of you are actually keeping your meds categorized and organized and labeled so when if the, one of your kids gets stung by a bee, you exactly know where that EpiPen is or the bee sting pads. So again, create that first aid kit, get all your meds together, create that first aid kit so when somebody does get hurt with Band-Aids, you can go right to that kit and go about your day. But again, let everybody know about the system so when something does happen, you know where to grab it. But not only a first aid kit, but organize all your meds this time of year. And it's a preference whether you want to throw out expired medications. I always say, you know what, everybody has their own thoughts on that. 
it's a preference so do do what you want to do but at least organize categorize and label them so when you need something you can go about again it's all about efficiency you oh, grab it you people say oh, I don't have time I can't you know but you're gonna save so much time by all these little things will add up in the long run um, if you do end up disposing of expired medication look up places there are places yep. in the state where you can dispose of them responsibly that's super important I gathered up all my expired medication, all the stuff that we had in uh, on one of those drop-off days mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. state had. Yep. Went and dropped it off at, at, a, um, at a pharmacy. There was a cop right there, and I said, whoop, there you go, and I got a free hand sanitizer. Oh, there you go. There you go. And I, your I labels felt, organized. Yeah. Been at home. I felt <laughs> so good about it. Nice. Right? That you're being responsible. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Um, and I thought that it was good. You you made a note that uh, you want, when you do get this organized, that you talk to your family about yes. it so everybody knows. Yeah, that's way you can make your kids more independent, too, if they come in with a scrape. They don't have to bother you if it's not an emergency. They, they know the right, right way to go where that band-aid is. And then when they're done, they'll put the container back. So get everybody working independently. Okay. Number eight. This could be easy. Yeah. Water bottles. Oh, this is this is a one. And so many people have like, cabinets full of water <laughs> bottles. Because you get them free when you, you know, do so, a run or something. or So now you have all these free water bottles or water bottles that are in your cabinet. How many are you using? How many do you need? Evaluate that. It's, this is a really quick, easy project. And again, you might be able to free up a whole shelf in your kitchen or in a pantry, wherever. So again, simple, just take inventory. How many do you need? What, which ones are broken? Which ones don't have straws anymore? Evaluate, five minute project and you're done. 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 Easy, mark it off. Okay, under the kitchen sink. I like this one too, you had a good tips here. Yeah, under the kitchen sink. So how much of what is under there, do you even know what's under there? Because you continue to buy, but then you push towards the back. So now you're pushing and you you don't know what you have anymore. So take everything out, again, everything out, categorize it. Is there, do you have duplicate Windexes, but you have a bathroom upstairs, maybe you want to put another Windex upstairs. So when you're cleaning, you can grab that. And then once everything's out, I like to lay down um, either a um, contact paper or a heavy duty plastic covering. So that way the wood underneath on the, the um, under the kitchen sink doesn't get ruined. A lot of people don't put that there and it starts to ruin the wood because things leak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I want you to contain things. So containing things will help you free up space, maximize space. And that way you can categorize out your dishwashing liquids and your actual cleaners. I love the idea of putting containers under there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that makes so much yes, sense. Yes, maximize the space. Okay, another good one, wrapping paper. So this is a good one too, because a lot of kids have birthday parties this time of year, and they have you know a lot of stuff going on. So birthday parties, you can separate out like birthday, Christmas, holidays, and remember, decide what you have first. It could be a bin that you want to stand up your wrapping paper in, or you could function under the bed. You might want to have a roll away under the bed organizer for your paper. So take inventory of what you have and then purchase the piece to match what you have. Just don't go out and purchase the products because you're like, oh yeah, I have all this paper. I'm going to use this, but it doesn't really work. So categorize everything out and think about, you could use a bin, whatever it may be, but it's a great time because you don't want to go to the store and buy duplicate wrapping paper. When you don't need it, if it's organized, you'll go to it and grab it. Uh, I like the idea if you have a lot of stuff like that, or like this is what I have. I have a a bin and I probably should organize it a little bit better <laughs> but we it's kind of the catch-all for wrapping materials so tissue paper bags yeah because I like to reuse the bags yeah, I don't too, yeah, buy, yeah. right bows yeah cards so if you stock up on greeting cards or thank you cards that kind of stuff yeah. so all that so it doesn't have to just be wrapping paper right. you can get all that kind of stuff organized and contain them in little bins put yeah. them on shelves label them again efficiency you go to it you grab it you're not wasting money because you know exactly where the wrapping paper is and you can grab it yeah thinking oh I have this bottle of wine that I want to take over to a friend's because they're having a housewarming party, what can I put it in? Right. right. You know exactly. You'll go to the basement, find the wine bottle bag, and yep. go Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. Number 11, plants. Who knew you so, could organize plants, but you can. You can, and you can declutter plants. So if you have any, go around your house. I, I know people who have dead plants in their house. Dead plants in feng shui is dead energy and it does not contribute well to the nice flow of positive energy in your home. So I don't want to tell you to throw out your dead plants, but if you can nurse them back to life, do so. If you can't, I want you to get rid of them because it just doesn't bode well for the energy in your home. So go around the house, check out all your plants, see what needs attention, what you can bring back to life, and what you can repot and bring in new plants into the home. People forget about that. They forget about like plants in the house sometimes. Or like on the back steps yeah. or the front steps even. Mm -hmm. Yep, so do a nice little inventory of your, and that's a quick project too. Okay, number 12, that's we're wrapping fine. up here. Yep. The trunk. So we're getting ready for beach season, hopefully soon. 
and it's time to take out your shovels, your scrapers. What? I don't want to talk too soon. I, mean, I saw well, snow in the well, forecast maybe, next week. I don't yeah, know. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe plan this for the end of the month. Okay. <laughs> so take everything out of the trunk. Give it a good vacuuming. Switch out maybe your beach chairs now, summer stuff. But you probably haven't looked in your trunk all season, so it's time to reevaluate. Again, quick project this weekend. Take everything out, or at the end of the month, you could put this on your calendar for. Figure out what's in there, and then swap out seasonal. I thought about this, too. Uh, this is a good time of year to look at your emergency kit. We should all have an emergency thing. kit yes. in our trunk. First Whether, aid. Yeah, first your first aid kit. kit. You should have all the stuff in your car, which you may or may not have. Yep. I may or may not have. But we should all have it with the first aid kit, mm -hmm. yeah, blanket, all that kind of stuff. So if you do get stuck on the side of the road, like a phone charger, Everything. all that kind yeah. of stuff. Nice yeah, nice little packet of all that stuff. So it's a good time to check on that. And then if you want to, you can make it as well. So that's a good time to yeah, check on your perfect. Trunk, right? Yeah, it's great. And then the vacuum it all out and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that was super fun, Kristen. I yes, love doing these quick I love doing these quick Yeah, they're ones. fun. I know. And, and hopefully it helped you, motivated you just a little bit as well. So Kristen yes. McRae with Organizing NRI, 12 projects that you can complete in 30 minutes for spring, help you get you organized and energized. Thanks so much, Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Molly. Thanks. All right, everyone, we're going to bring in our next guest. Ray Rickman joins us now for his weekly opinion broadcast, Rickman's Big View. He is the founder of Stages of Freedom. I'm going to let Ray take it away. Thank you, Molly. Uh, do you know how you think you know things and you don't? I've been involved with the gun issue for about 30 years when I was in the General Assembly. I put bills in that went no place. And I hope in every single conversation opens the same with me. I'm in favor of the Second Amendment, but let's get rid of weapons of mass destruction. Let's get rid of these basically uh, machine guns parading as something else. But I'm in favor of the Second Amendment. And the reason you say that is because Democrats in particular, of which I'm one, they're frightened of being called extremists by the NRA. That is, that we want to take away people's guns. That's their argument, that uh, we're going to get started with the big weapons and then we're going to come and take people's six-shooters. And so it's a political discussion structured by the other side. They have frightened everybody into never saying, do we need guns in America? Now remember, if you take the top 20 Western nations, this is the only one that has guns. In Great Britain, they don't have any. In Canada, they have very few. It just Australia, no guns. They don't have them. And they don't have them because people use guns to kill people. Are, are, are you with me? They use guns and they use these weapons like Las Vegas to, to kill, to wound 500 people, to kill 50 people. That can't happen in Great Britain. So former Republican, United States Supreme Court Justice, John Paul Stevens, came out with an essay the other day saying that we should eliminate the Second Amendment. We should abolish it. The Second Amendment. And of course, this is what the argument's about. The Second Amendment is more important than our children's lives. The Second Amendment is more important than the six-year-olds in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. People actually say that. I heard uh, someone say the other day, he has a right to his fun. He said that on public radio. That's why he has a right to have any gun he wants, which is an absurdity, a total absurdity. But we have to have a discussion about that, that, he, that the Second Amendment is sacred. So this Republican, former U.S. Supreme Court Justice said, let's abolish it, and we won't have a right to have guns in this country. And over time, even if we don't take anybody's gun, 40 years from today, we'll have virtually no guns, like Great Britain, like Canada, like Australia, like Mexico. So I just thought it was the most fascinating thing. And from now on, I'm not going to open every one of my discussions with, I believe in the Second Amendment. I don't know if I do or not anymore. I probably never have, but I do.
because I don't think you can take people's guns. I'm not sure you want to take Western hunters' guns or people in Detroit who need them for security. So I probably believe in the Second Amendment, but I'm not sure I do. Did you hear me? I do, but I don't. Now let me share my favorite political quote with you as I end, and I, I hope you'll pay some attention to it. Because I, I heard Barry Goldwater give this when he was running for president of the United States. I'm sure it was a stadium in the suburbs of Detroit. I'm sure I was the only Democrat at that, uh, 14,000 people, and I was the only one. I was not a Barry Goldwater person. I just went. I wanted to see him up close. And he opened by saying, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in pursuit of happiness is no virtue. Can I say it again? Extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in the pursuit of happiness is no virtue. So this Republican retired U.S. Supreme Justice knows that it's extreme to want to protect our liberties. Navigate Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'd like to say hello and welcome to Janet Quick. She is the director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Janet, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Great to be here. So I'm very excited to have you in the studio. We have lots to talk about, but first of all, happy Cohog Week. Happy Cohog Week. I've been celebrating all week, eating lots and lots of Cohogs. So uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be celebrating this in Rhode Island. We are so fortunate enough to have a wonderful local seafood industry. Uh, and we're celebrating Cohog Week because not only of the environmental aspects, but the cultural and heritage impacts and aspects of that. And so you're going to kind of fill us in on all of that and why Cohogs and shellfish overall are important to Rhode Island. So let's start a little bit about um, why Quahog shellfish are important to Rhode Island and we'll kind of break it down into economy, environmental, and overall. Okay. Well, I could start way back before <laughs> the colonial settlers uh, because clams and seafood have been important um, for native populations, both for food and for jewelry and for um, currency. But more recently, we've been celebrating them um, because of the jobs, um, the delicious local seafood, and then what they say about our bay. And also, what's more Rhode Island than a quahog? So they are here locally, we manage them locally, they don't migrate anywhere. Um, last year we harvested over 20 million clams, all sustainably harvested, and it's a year-round industry. And we picked March because it's kind of a slow time for the seafood industry. People are thinking about it more in the summer, and we just wanted to give people a reminder that we have uh, fresh local seafood all year round, and we have a whole fleet of people who go out every day um, and they harvest fresh clams. So it's kind of a fun way to celebrate our history, our economy, local food, and then the water quality in the bay that makes it possible to harvest more and more clams in the broader area each year. I think that's so fascinating too that we're looking at the timing and because I was going to ask you kind of what's the point of yeah. all this right yeah. so we're looking at March specifically um, let's talk a little bit about uh, why it's important to buy locally and then we'll get into some of the other aspects. Great. So we work a lot the Department of Environmental Management is fortunate to oversee the Division of Agriculture um, so get fresh buy local we work very hard on trying to increase the amount of food that is produced and consumed locally there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that it supports local jobs, um, local families, local stories. These cohoggers who are going out before dawn and doing this back-breaking work, 
they're our friends, they're our neighbors, and we want to support their businesses. But on top of that, we're not transporting food anywhere. It's fresh. We're not spending gas and, um, and uh, not really knowing where it comes from. We know the water quality in the areas that we harvest fish and shellfish in the bay is good. Um, so it's kind of knowing your local food, reducing the footprint around transport, and then really just supporting local businesses. And when they, when they um, sell locally, and then we have them in our restaurants, we're kind of keeping that currency local and leveraging all the benefits. Um, so we want to support, and we have a great diverse fishing fleet. It's a year-round fleet. Um, the hundreds of people who are cohoggers are just a small part of a bigger um, commercial fishing industry that is quintessentially Rhode Island, and it has thousands of jobs associated it, with it. Uh, so we really want to encourage people to support those local businesses. And of course, it's delicious, <laughs> it's fresh, we have a million different ways to serve them. I've been having a blast having stuffies and chowder and, of course, rock lambs, um, which are my favorite. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so good. I know I was having this, it's kind of a heated debate here in Rhode Island, what your favorite yes. type of clam fun. chowder is or what your favorite clam dish is. Or, so it's always kind of a fun debate or not necessarily debate, but fun conversation to yeah. have. So it's good. It's good to do that. Yeah. And it's always fun to be able to have those conversations across the board wherever you are or when you bring people into Rhode Island to be able to take them to get some chowder and to expose them to yeah. Rhode Island seafood, which you really can't get other places except for I found out today through a materials that yeah. your office provided <laughs> me that you can get Rhode Island shellfish in 50 states. That's fascinating. Well, I think it might have been that all 50 states have shellfish, um, harvest shellfish, that we're talking about the importance of shellfish. Okay. I think that might have been the fact, but I, I want to say about Quahog Week that yes, we picked March because it's kind of a slow time and we want to remind people we have this uh, fresh seafood all year round, but we do have 22 restaurants that have signed up to feature uh, Quahogs this week and Dave's Marketplace as well. So if you look on www.riseafood.com, there's all this information about Quahog Week and the restaurants that are participating. They're not the only ones who are serving local seafood, but they kind of signed up, up to promote uh, Quahogs this week. So get it at Dave's, local, buy local at a local place. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the economy. You're talking about Rhode Island fisher people going out and doing, <laughs> and doing this labor. Um, let's talk a little bit about how how this really is embedded in our economy and has been for quite some time. Um, and when you are looking at the numbers, it really is quite quite remarkable, uh, whether you're talking about the fishing ports and how much we export or how much we're bringing in, uh, jobs and that sort of thing. Really, how, how integrated is, whether it's fishing or shelf fishing, right. how big of this is it to our economy? So we have uh, thousands of fishermen in, our, in Rhode Island. For the shelf fishermen, there's probably about two, three hundred who are doing it as their main um, living, and then other people are doing it to supplement an income. It might be a teacher who's going out um, with a license in the summertime. I do want to say, and I'll get back to your question, that anyone can go for free with a rake and dig for clams in areas that are um, safe and open for, for fishing. So that's a really cool thing about Rhode Island that you can go come access, here. Yeah, yeah access, just access. We're special that way. But in terms of the, we have over, um, we have 240 boats at the Port of Galilee, uh, 270, excuse me, 40 um, at, our, at our port in Newport. The, the Cohoggers are in Bristol, they're in Warwick, they're in East Greenwich, they're in North and South Kingstown. So they're, they're littler operations all across the state and they really are integrated to our economy. So we have the jobs, the thousands of jobs related to the people who are fishing and then the folks who are selling the ice or making the nets or the equipment and then the distributors and the restaurants. So it's a big part of our food uh, economy. However, one of the interesting things, quahogs are probably mostly consumed locally, but a lot of our seafood is exported. And we are the biggest uh, squid port on the Atlantic coast. Our calamari is enjoyed all over the world. Um, so we do, we have an opportunity to consume more locally, but our industry is known all around the world. That's excellent. 5.51 million Rhode Island aquaculture farm value. That's incredible. Right. Yeah, our, our aquaculture industry is mostly oysters. Um, though recently we've had nine kelp farms get started, awesome. so that's interesting. I do you want but to they, follow up with yeah, that? Yeah, they that's are, um, uh, that's an uh, increasing sector and valuable. Uh, 
the the oyster is um, beloved and more valuable than the clam in terms of the um, what a consumer pays. So we see that as a growing area, and again, it reflects our very good water quality. And that, let me just say on that, our water quality has improved dramatically over the last 20 years, and we have the cleanest bay that we've had in 100 years. So that means that the DEM has been able to open more and more areas to shell fishing um, because it's safe. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we, we looked at the economical impact and how it's kind of all tied in, but really Quahog Week, looking at the environmental aspect. So when we're looking at shellfish, they're bivalves, they're very yeah. good for the environment. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the environmental aspect when we're promoting this. Right. How is it all really, how are these sustainable food systems really all tied together environmentally? So the habitat, it's all about habitat. And the water quality is improved by reducing pollutants into our bay. It's as simple as that. It didn't happen without strong laws and a lot of enforcement, but the water quality um, and the um, ability to make sure we're not getting all sorts of pollutants from our industries and from our wastewater treatment facilities into the bay has made a real revival um, where we have both people recreating in the upper bay and fishing in the upper bay. And we have seen where the water quality has improved, the habitat's improved. So we, we sustainably manage all of our fish stocks based on science. So you look at these clams, you, they, you can only harvest them when they get big enough and you can almost only harvest a certain amount. So we make sure it's a real renewable resource. Um, and they filter water, they're part of the habitat, they're part of improving water quality. So they serve a ecosystem function and then of course they're delicious on your plate. I mean, it really is fascinating. And time and time again, having these conversations with experts like yourself, that people talk about the water quality in the Bay has improved drastically over the course of the years through efforts of Rhode Islanders. Right. Are we where we want to be? And do we have goals for the next five years, 10 years for the shell fishing industry, for the environmental industry? Are we where we want to be? And where are we looking at for the future? So I'll answer that in two ways. In terms of water quality, um, we want to keep reducing stormwater runoff from our, our roads and bridges and our um, uh, parking lots. So that's something we're continuing to work on. And of course, we're concerned about climate change. And that does alter the dynamic in our waterways. Um, as the water gets warmer, you'll have more algae blooms. And so it's something that we're really uh, concerned about and working on in many directions. With the fishing industry, our shell fishing industry has had ups and downs um, as the bay has changed, as the economy has changed. We think we're on an upswing. If we can eat local, we can increase the value um, to our local businesses. And we believe that our diverse fishing industry is vibrant and that we have more opportunities for it to grow. Fascinating. It's And what I think is so cool about Rhode Island is that it really is all tied together. And so that there are multiple right. partnering agencies that are continuing to work together that you might not see other places. Right. Um, I do want to ask you, because you mentioned that there's continuing efforts for kelp farms, so we are yeah. seeing to that yeah. grow. Um, I've had conversations with people here, not only in the culinary side of things that are harvesting right. kelp, but um, had conversations as well for sea vegetables and their efforts for biofuels. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is, like you mentioned, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of potential. I'm wondering if there is, uh, is there any strategy? Is there any thoughts on continuing investment for sea vegetables here in Rhode Island for the future? So we, talking about partnerships, the Coastal yeah. Resources Management Council is the lead agency on aquaculture, and we work closely with them every day. Um, but there is a lot of innovation and excitement yeah. around what we might possibly do to increase aquaculture, including uh, mussels on strings, you know, out, off, off of wind farms, including uh, kelp and other um, vegetable matter. So I have a feeling with our open arms that the people who are interested in this are gonna see that we do some cool things in Rhode Island. Okay, so well, I guess wait and see. Yeah, wait and see. But honestly, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating. Lot, uh, and it's one, fascinating. Right, and people who are interested in this, yeah. um, the Roger Williams University has a great training program, and you see people, entrepreneurs, really coming up with ideas, and we're just trying to be fertile ground for them to grow. Especially, like you mentioned, with the ocean temperatures changing, we're not right. really knowing yeah. where to go, so the potential for this market could be huge. We just kind of have to see where it goes, right. and we have the water. We have the water, <laughs> but you know, we have to be, we're definitely uh, careful with multiple uses of exactly. our waterways, yeah. so it's been an issue where we want to be very careful, and I think we've grown at the right pace, even though we've grown rapidly, 
And our seafood has an excellent reputation. Our shellfish, our, our um, squid. So I think it's one of the things we can really be proud of. And all of the restaurants that, I, that are working on Quahog Week, they're making connections with local uh, Quahoggers, local fishermen. So they know that their food is fresh, that it's coming from a local business. And I think that's really exciting to the consumer too. It is very exciting for multiple people involved. Um, before we let you go, because I know you do have to run, we've kept you here for a long time. We've been very Captive. excited to stay. Talk to me about clams and other things. Um, I want to talk to you. Volvo Race is coming up soon. You played a, a big part yeah. in helping bring it back to Rhode Island. Thoughts on the race coming back? Um, May, so it's very right, soon. Right. Talk to so, us just a little right. bit about yeah. your feelings. Yeah, so again, something that lets us showcase all the things that are special about Rhode Island. A new port in our Fort Adams State Park is the one North American stopover for this round the world sailing race, um, which has the best you know, athletes in that field doing this exciting, very exciting race. Um, so it's coming to Newport. We don't know the exact day that these boats come <laughs> from Brazil because it's a race. <laughs> it's but right. the, um, the village opens on May 8th. Um, there will be racing around the Fort Adams State Park on the 19th and there'll be, the boats will be coming in and there's um, an exploration zone to learn about science with the Graduate School of Oceanography. There's all sorts of um, food vendors, local food, um, it, just a lot of excitement around these very modern racing boats and all of the teams from around the world. Um, so we think it's fantastic. We get to showcase the beauty of Rhode Island, our sailing and maritime history, um, the wind that we're using for our first offshore wind farm that is powering sailboats and has throughout our history. And it's, I can't tell you how much fun it is. Um, last year we had about 130,000 people. Wow. There's music, um, there's excitement. It's a gorgeous place to be. It makes you really proud of Rhode Island. So May 8th is when it opens. Um, the boats will arrive probably the 10th or 11th, and then there's just lots of excitement. And um, that last weekend, the 19th and 20th, are really, it's the place to be. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to having that there. Um, and as a person who helps kind of guide this yeah. in uh, integral part of bringing it, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> I think it's fantastic for Rhode Island. I mean, we competed against many other places, Baltimore, yeah. Miami, Boston, New York. And so I was just talking to some of the race organizers um, three years ago when they were here. They thought it was the absolute best venue. People wanted cool. to come back. I'm hoping we can make it a permanent part of this very exciting around the world ocean race. Oh, me too. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for joining us today. Janet Coit, the director of the DEM here. Go out and get yourself some yes. local shellfish. Go eat clams. Go eat some clams. I know okay. that's what I have to ask. Sometimes I just get too <laughs> much what I'm gonna do. That's what I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're wrapping yeah. up here on Go Look okay. Live and the Navigate Credit Union Broadcast Center. Thanks so much for joining us thank hey, you. here today. I'm Molly O'Brien.